Good afternoon and welcome to the City of Toronto's COVID-19 media briefing for Monday, March the 29th, 2021. Joining us today is Toronto Mayor John Tory, Toronto Fire Chief and the General Manager of the Office of Emergency Management, Matthew Pegg, and Toronto's Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Eileen Davila. Mayor Tory. <clears throat> well, Brad, thank you very much and good afternoon. Our message today continues to be very simple, first and foremost, please get vaccinated. Our Team Toronto effort to get people vaccinated across the city is going strong with more than 481,000 doses administered by the city and by hospitals and our healthcare partners, pharmacies and family doctors across the City of Toronto. And I want to say a special word of thanks to the 16,220 people who booked appointments to get vaccinated over the weekend. This morning, we opened two additional mass immunization clinics in Willowdale and Malvern and we're on track to open another site at the hangar in Downsview next Monday. These mega clinics are just one part of the effort that Team Toronto is making to getting shots in the arms of Torontonians, ideally all three million of us. 19 clinics are operating across the city today thanks to our hospital and healthcare partners and the efforts of the city itself. We continue to urge people who are over the age of 70, 70 or over, to book their vaccine appointment if you were born in 1951 or earlier. You are eligible right now, if you were born in 1951 or earlier, to get your dose of vaccine at our city-run clinics. There is no time better than the present to get this protection at a time when the variants are posing a renewed threat, as we'll hear from Dr. Davila today. I strongly urge people who are eligible to get their shot as soon as possible. As Dr. Davila will detail in her report today, the COVID-19 cases are on the rise, helped by the variants. The sooner we're all vaccinated, the sooner this pandemic will be over. So please don't wait. Go online now at toronto.ca slash COVID-19 or call 1-888-999-6488. Our vaccine efforts depend almost entirely on vaccine supply from the other governments. As you know, the federal government secures the vaccine supply and the provincial governments distribute it to municipalities in the case of Ontario. Today, the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area mayors and chairs met as they do every Monday and issued a statement following the meeting urging the two governments, the federal and provincial governments, to work together to make sure reliable and increased supplies of vaccine doses are available to our region and to other regions across the country that have been particularly hard hit by the virus. An objective examination of the numbers indicates that the GTHA, the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, is a COVID hotspot in the country and we were unanimous in asking that that be taken into account in vaccine allocations alongside other hotspots in the country. Our best public health advice is that we need to have as much vaccine as possible right now in order to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. We've heard questions from people about how homebound residents will be vaccinated. Toronto Public Health defines homebound clients as those that receive chronic home care and those who, due to physical, social or mental barriers, are consistently unable to leave their home to visit a clinic a pharmacy or primary care provider, including to receive COVID-19 vaccinations. These people are also unable to grocery shop or to do other essential activities outside of their home. Eligibility to participate in homebound vaccinations is being coordinated by the Provincial Local Health LIN and is determined by a person being a client of a publicly funded home care agency, a private home care agency, or primary care provider who does home visits to clients. These agencies will be communicating directly with their clients about who is eligible for this homebound vaccination program, ensuring eligibility is key to this area. Much as we might like to, we simply don't have the resources and the ability to do a max vac vaccination at home for those who can make it to a clinic as we continue to undertake the largest vaccination effort in the city's history. This is an important part of the overall vaccination campaign and one that relies on good cooperation with provincial health officials and home care agencies. The Toronto Central LIN, the provincial health organization, estimates there are around 3,500 people who are eligible to receive homebound vaccination service 
and this will largely be done by the primary care providers, the home-based care providers working with Toronto EMS and the Ontario Health working with the Toronto EMS. These are the people that will provide the homebound service to those who are eligible. Right now, this work very much relies, as everything else does, on the vaccine supply being available and our ability to move it in a timely manner. Toronto EMS, our paramedics, completed a pilot of homebound vaccinations last week, and we will be incorporating the lessons learned from that pilot into this work. If they haven't heard from their care provider very soon, people unsure if they qualify for the homebound vaccination service should contact their primary care provider, their primary health care provider, in many cases a doctor, or their home care provider to confirm if they qualify for this program. This is separate from our ongoing work to get Toronto Community Housing seniors' buildings vaccinated. Teams are in those buildings going door to door, and the massive vaccination effort in our long-term care homes, retirement homes, and other places where we know a high number of seniors live are as well separate and apart from the homebound program. We continue to urge seniors who are able to visit the city-run clinics or other hospital or health care clinics to get their vaccination at those locations, and we urge relatives and friends to offer help with registration and transportation, as so many relatives and friends have already done, and we're immensely grateful for that help. Our clinics have been placed so as to accommodate seniors and their attendants, and, and we will help to ensure that we focus our mobile efforts on those who we know are homebound and have no other way to get vaccinated. We continue to make progress finding ways to safely provide city recreational services with the guidance of public health officials. I'm proud to report that the City of Toronto's Welcome TO Winter Parks Plan welcomed skaters to 54 outdoor artificial art rinks and 46 uh, natural ice rinks this season. And the season, of course, wrapped up as planned due to the warmer weather on March the 21st. The city's outdoor artificial ice rinks were popular this past season with more than 800,000 visits, uh, almost 60,000 service hours delivered at those rinks. More than 35,000 family accounts were created or updated, enabling more individuals and families to make a reservation at one of these rinks. I want to say a word of thanks to the more than 900 recreation workers uh, who supported rink operations during the 2021 season, which was an unusual season, and hope we can be back to a business in the normal fashion by wintertime next year. I want to also say thank you to the community groups who worked with the city to facilitate 46 natural ice rinks uh, in parks across Toronto this winter. Work is already underway to uh, to ready our parks and amenities for the spring and for the summer. The city will be opening its five golf courses for the 2021 season on Thursday, April the 1st, a few days ahead of schedule. Humber Valley Golf Course is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. In recent years, Humber Valley has been redesigned to be accessible for golfers with differing abilities. It is regarded as one of the premier courses of its kind in all of Canada, and we're very proud of that. Toronto's courses are all affordable, all high quality, and all TTC accessible. Golf is a permitted outdoor activity under the current provincial regulations, and staff have worked with Toronto Public Health to ensure that golfing is as safe at city courses as it can be during the COVID-19 pandemic. Golfers are encouraged to book in advance through the city's website at toronto.ca slash golf or by calling the individual golf course. Now it's time for Chief Pegg to give his daily report on the vaccine effort. Thank you, Mayor Tory, and uh, good afternoon. On Saturday, March 27th, the province of Ontario extended vaccine eligibility to Toronto residents who are 70 years of age and older. At eight o'clock this morning, the provincial booking system was again expanded to include those who are 70 years of age and older, both in Toronto and outside Toronto. Between Saturday morning and 1 o'clock this afternoon, more than 19,000 people have successfully booked their COVID-19 vaccination appointment in one of the city-operated clinics between now and April 11th. Also, as of 1 o'clock this afternoon, there are approximately 7,700 first-dose appointment slots available between now and Friday this week, although bookings are occurring steadily. 
This, of course, is in addition to the appointments booked in healthcare partner operated clinics and pharmacies. At 11 o'clock this morning, two additional city operated mass immunization clinics began operations. This includes the clinic in the Malvern Community Recreation Centre and the clinic inside the Mitchell Field Arena. I'm pleased to report that the uptake in both of these community centre based clinics has been extremely positive. As of this morning, the Malvern Community Centre Clinic is fully booked from today through April 1st, with appointments being available on April 2nd and beyond. Also as of this morning, the Mitchell Field Arena Clinic is fully booked from today through April 6th, with appointments being available on April 7 and beyond. The Scarborough Town Centre Clinic location is fully booked from today through April 1, with appointments being available on April 2 and beyond. Both the Metro Toronto Convention Centre Clinic location and the Toronto Congress Centre Clinic location still have appointments available each day this week. This is largely as a result of the fact that we have significantly increased the daily capacity in both of these clinics, thereby opening additional appointments. As of this morning, we are, we are able to administer more than 42,000 vaccines this week in our network of five city-operated mass immunization clinics. Operations in all five city-operated clinics are running smoothly today. Wait times for those who arrive shortly before their scheduled appointment are very short, with most people not having to wait at all. At present, the majority of clients are in and out of the clinic in approximately 30 minutes. All five of our city operated clinics will be open and operating as normal throughout the upcoming Easter long weekend, including Good Friday, Easter Sunday and Easter Monday. Anyone who was born in 1951 or earlier can book their appointment to receive their COVID-19 vaccine by accessing the online booking system, which is available at toronto.ca slash COVID-19. Or if you were born in 1951 or earlier and would prefer to book by phone, please call 1-888-999-6488. If you have family or friends who were born in 1951 or earlier and who may need assistance or encouragement to book their COVID-19 vaccination appointment, please assist them in booking their appointment. Our immunization task force is continuing to, it, continuing to identify viable options to ensure that every available COVID-19 vaccine dose is administered each week. At present, the provincial booking system which is the system in use for all city operated clinics does not provide for standby list functionality. Our immunization task force, however, is actively exploring options to maximize the administration of vaccine on a daily basis. But let me stress that no vaccine is wasted. Unused vaccine is either carried over to the next day's inventory or is reallocated to our healthcare partners for administration in their respective clinics. I want to thank each and every client who arrives for their confirmed appointment no earlier than 15 minutes prior. This greatly assists us in ensuring that your experience is both timely and efficient. I also thank everyone for limiting the number of support people that they bring with them to the clinic by bringing only those necessary to support and assist them in moving through the clinic. I continue to encourage anyone who requires a mobility device, such as a walker or a wheelchair, to bring their device with them for their vaccine appointment whenever possible. We have increased the number of mobility devices we have on site, along with increasing the number of trained healthcare professionals and emergency first responders on site who are available to help anyone who requires assistance in moving through the process. I remind everyone that vaccinations are only available by appointment and are not available on a walk-in basis at this time. Please do not contact 311 nor Toronto Public Health for assistance in booking your COVID-19 vaccination appointment as our staff are not able to access the COVAX system on your behalf. Please continue to monitor toronto.ca slash COVID-19 for the most up-to-date information on immunizations in Toronto. 
I will now invite Dr. Davila to provide her update. Thank you, Chief, and good afternoon. Today, I am reporting 670 new cases of COVID-19. 16 new admissions bring the number of people in hospital to 302. 53 people are in the ICU. We are reporting two more deaths to COVID-19, sadly. The current number of total cases screened positive for variants of concern is 7,752. When thinking about case counts, variants, and virus spread, I want to mention three things. First, between last Thursday and today, we have seen 4,155 new cases of COVID-19. Second, from last Thursday until today, 89 people have been admitted to hospital. And third, anecdotally, I'm hearing from colleagues at Toronto hospitals that increasingly, admissions are of younger people and often directly to the ICU. Within our figure of 670 cases today, 227 are people between the ages of 20 and 39. That's just shy of 35%. The data continue to paint a picture of worsening resurgence and escalating cases. Add to that, Passover is underway. Good Friday and the Easter weekend are in just a few days and Ramadan begins just one week thereafter. Unfortunately, our track record around holidays isn't very good. This past Christmas, the seven-day moving average was 660 cases. Two weeks later, it had increased to about 1,000 cases. People gathered, and this caused the virus to spread. Now is not the time to gather. We are not well enough protected. There is no reason to believe that history won't repeat itself. In fact, we have every reason to believe that it could be worse, given the transmissibility of variants of concern. If you've been vaccinated, I want to remind you about something you will have been told the day you were got your vaccination. The vaccines don't work instantly. The body needs time to create an, an immune response. But it doesn't happen overnight. It takes at least two weeks. So in the days following vaccination, you will not have sufficient immunity to protect you immediately. We know that the vaccines approved for use in Canada will protect you from serious illness and death. We also know vaccination provides the path forward to all those activities that we've missed so much for more than a year now. In the United States, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommends that it's okay for fully vaccinated people to be indoors with other fully vaccinated people. And in those instances, nobody has to wear a mask or watch their distance. The emphasis is on fully vaccinated. We know there aren't a lot of fully vaccinated people in Toronto yet. We'll get there, but we're not there now. For anyone who misses hugging someone else, anyone who wants to see their grandchildren grow year over year, anyone who wants to spend time close to someone else without thinking about whether it's safe or not. The vaccines are the answer. If you've had yours, please don't gamble with it yet. 
especially with the variants dominating the infections in Toronto and case counts rising, and particularly if it's just the first dose you've had. Have confidence in the protection the vaccines provide, but don't risk anyone's health quite yet. If you're waiting for your turn, don't forget, the only thing protecting you from COVID-19 right now are the steps you take to protect yourself. Getting your vaccine will protect you from all we feared in the last year. Giving the vaccine time to work and people time to get vaccinated is the foundation of that protection. With that, I'll hand it over to Brad for the question and answer period. Thank you, Dr. Davila. Uh, before we do that, uh, just a reminder to reporters to please unmute yourself before asking a question. We'll go first to Matt Bingley from Global News. Matt. Hi, good afternoon. Dr. Davila, uh, just on the rising case counts, uh, we've obviously seen a number of changes to the gray zone, uh, allowing you know outdoor dining, other things uh, of that nature. And I'm just wondering, with, with that in mind, seeing these cases going up do you think that it, additional restrictions are needed to start reeling that back in or do you think that those things will be allowed to continue even as cases continue to soar uh, or, or do you have a red line in there somewhere so matt thanks for the question um you know as i've indicated in my remarks uh, you know i'm concerned with what we see in terms of the numbers we're seeing a you know, resurgence of cases and escalating activity. Uh, and at the same time, we recognize that uh, you know, people are tired. It's been a very difficult and long year. Um, and we do also recognize, uh, as we've learned over the course of the past year and a bit, that you know, being outdoors, while not zero risk, is certainly much lower risk in terms of transmission of the virus. So I think what you're seeing here is, is certainly, um, uh, you know, cause for concern as we look at, at the numbers and recognize that there is ongoing transmission uh, and, and trying to find uh, that space where we're, we're giving people opportunities to, um, you know, be outside, enjoy, you know, nicer weather after a long winter in a lower risk environment, but of course constantly watching and making sure that we're doing the best we can to reduce transmission to the greatest extent possible while we try to roll out those vaccines, which will provide that path forward, as I've just talked about in the remarks. This is the way forward. But vaccines are most effective. They will deliver the best protection that they can for us and move us into that space where we all want to be, you know, with life a little bit more like it used to be, um, if we we're able to keep transmission down to the greatest extent possible. So really people were, were, were really looking for people to continue those um, measures for self-protection as much as possible to the greatest extent that they can so that vaccines can have their best effect. Uh, uh, yeah, but I, I guess when it comes to, you, you know, you already pointed out that when it came to Easter last year and other holidays, we don't really have a good track record. So just seeing what we are on the precipice of another uh, potentially indoor, mass indoor event, <laughs> you know, in, in contradiction to what you're recommending, what what would be the the opportunity that you would see that this is really going out of control, even outside, and that there is a perception of, of uh, you know, things are loosened up outside. It doesn't matter what I do inside uh, with my, my family members. Well, you know, Matt, I, I think that we've been trying to make sure that people understand that it does matter. Um, it does make a difference. Uh, regardless of, of what framework there is and, and what rules might be provided for, uh, at the end of the day, what each of us does individually does make a difference. And we've actually seen the capacity for Toronto residents to um, you know, demonstrate good behavior in, in terms of reducing transmission. Uh, there have been moments clearly where that has been less than ideal, but we've also seen some real strength and real um, you know, a vigilance uh, practiced by Toronto residents uh, when they appreciate and understand that this is the best path forward. Uh, add to that now, we have vaccines available to us and they are 
protective. They are effective. We've seen that, not just here uh, within the context of long-term care homes and retirement homes, but we've also seen the experiences in jurisdictions around the world. So again, I would encourage people to really be vigilant. Uh, we're, we're almost there. If we can uh, you know, maintain lower rates of transmission in our community, it gives vaccines the best chance to afford that protection for us all so that we can actually put this pandemic behind us sooner rather than later. Thank you. We'll go next to Dave Woodard from Global News Radio. Dave. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Davila. Can I get your reaction to the National Advisory Committee on Immunization recommending a pause on AstraZeneca vaccinations for people under the age of 55? So I haven't yet had the opportunity. I've heard, uh, you know, a little bit about it in the background, but haven't had an opportunity to really look at the recommendation. And I'm very interested, as you can well imagine, to see the specifics of the recommendation. I, I would say this, that it's important that we have, uh, you know, this, this activity happening, that there is a National Advisory Committee on Immunization constantly assessing and reassessing vaccines. Uh, we expect that our federal partners who are responsible for the regulation of vaccine use in Canada continue to play that very important role. And I'm certainly assured, as should be the people of Toronto and beyond, that there is uh, you know, active and constant assessment of, of the safety and effectiveness of vaccines so that we know that the products that are available you know, for use in Canada are being uh, constantly studied and used in accordance with the best available evidence. Okay, thank you. And I do have a question about the rules uh, surrounding schools and students. Uh, currently, if a child has symptoms and gets a COVID test, which comes back negative, they're allowed to return to class the very next day. But for a classmate of someone who tested positive, even if they do get a negative test, they still can't go to back to school for two weeks. Uh, that's been the policy since the beginning. But is it now time to take a look, another look at that policy and update it? So, you know, with respect to policies, whether they're in schools or in any other environment, uh, given that, you know, COVID-19 has been this rapidly evolving science and, and our understanding of what makes the best sense uh, has continuously developed as we learn more and more about the virus and, and we're now dealing with new variants of concern, uh, we're constantly reassessing policies and, and adapting them in accordance with the best available information and evidence. So I, I'm quite certain that our team, along with many other partners, uh, we're not alone in this, uh, in this field of activity. We're working with other partners throughout uh, the province, other local public health units, our, our partners at the provincial level, to constantly understand, you know, what are our current policies? Are they having the desired impact? And, you know, should they uh, need change? They, they're changed in accordance with the best available science and what we're seeing on the ground. Hey, thank you. We'll go next to Francine Copin from the Toronto Star. Francine? Oh, hi. There's been some, uh, there was some talk this morning, uh, Meritori, about possibly not having personal care um, retailers reopen um, in April. Um, how much longer before we know whether or not um, personal care outlets in Toronto will be able to open? <clears throat> well, for myself, uh, I've been very clear in saying that I think the provincial government was right to set a date on which it could be anticipated uh, these uh, personal uh, care businesses might be open. But at the same time, what I've also said is that as we take this on a day-by-day -day basis, I mean, this is a book that has a new chapter every single day, and the numbers are not getting better, they're getting worse, and that therefore it compels all of us uh, to uh, examine these things on a day-by-day -day basis as we've done continuously anyway. It's one of the first times in which we've had a date set out a couple of weeks as a target, as it were, when these businesses might open. But I think it's always been the case that, uh, I don't want to speak for the province, of course, but it's always been the case that that date is subject to what's going on and to discussions that are held closer to that time on the health care front, and I think that's true. So. Um, I think that's how we should uh, how we should handle this, which is to see how things are when we get a bit closer to the April the twelfth date. So um, the decision to keep them open or keep them closed is that a decision that you'll ask the province to make, or is it something that the city can um, take action to do itself? 
we've said all the way along that these kinds of decisions, because of the nature of the legislative framework, are better made by the province because they have more clearer uh, responsibility and ability to make those decisions. Uh, we've also said uh, where possible that if we didn't uh, find a decision that the province made uh, to our liking that uh, Dr. Davila or others could consider what other legislative powers that we have. But let's not speculate on that. Let's understand that the province has said that on April 12th they would anticipate under their framework these businesses opening subject to some conditions and that all I'm saying today and, and Dr. Davila obviously will want to chime in if she feels differently but all I'm saying for today is that I would think common sense would say that you will actually decide on exactly what day these open, earlier or later, likely, or on the very same day, based on what's going on with the health conditions at the time. It's a long way away. We're not even into April yet. Did you want to add anything, Dr. Deville? No, I, I think the mayor has covered the, the key points that, that clearly uh, that which happens and what opens I is under provincial regulation. They have the uh, more effective tools at their disposal in, in terms of uh, making those decisions. Uh, of course, we're in regular conversation with our provincial counterparts, informing them on what we're actually seeing here on the ground so that the decision that they make is actually well informed by our local experience and the local understanding of what's happening on the ground. Thank you. We'll go next to uh, Mark McAllister from City News. Mark? Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Davila, uh, question about uh, tracking and uh, gathering the race-based and income data. That is something that obviously has taken place throughout the pandemic in terms of positive cases. How will you be tracking and using that same data for vaccination specifically? And will you be mapping neighborhoods and communities? And on top of that, if I can, how and when will you be making that information public like you have for COVID case counts? So, Mark, I will probably have to go back and check on the specifics with the team. As you can well imagine, there are several data points that are constantly being collected uh, throughout the pandemic in terms of informing our response. These are important uh, elements. Uh, certainly, I can tell you that there are um, many data being collected within the provincial COVAX system. Uh, this is the method by which um, we are all throughout the province uh, collecting data on, um, you know, the vaccines being administered. This is a therapeutic and medical intervention. There is an obligation to ensure that the care is documented appropriately. And there are some other data that are collected there that aren't so much about the clinical experience, but more about the population level uh, experience and ensuring that we're, we're uh, um, you know, informing our actions on a go forward basis with the best available information. Uh, I don't have specific information yet about what we can be make public or what we're prepared to make public. Uh, there are many moving parts when it comes to those kinds of decisions, but certainly we have seen the benefit of having, uh, you know, socio-demographic data and race-based data collected to inform our actions on COVID cases. Uh, you can appreciate that, that there would be great value in uh, using those same kind of data to inform our vaccination efforts to ensure that we're, we're providing as equitable equitable, excuse me, an approach as is possible as we seek to vaccinate the entire population. Thank you. And a question to Mayor Tory. Uh, the request from yourself and other GTHA uh, mayors and chairs um, for additional vaccinations uh, or vaccine, just wanted to ask you, is, is this a, a special favor above and beyond? Is, isn't the vaccination allocation already taking into account that uh, municipalities like Toronto are already hot spots? Well, I think here's the way we look at it, I think. Um, this is a national effort uh, to defeat this virus. And I am perfectly understanding of and supportive of the need perhaps to have, say, a hot spot in BC or one in Quebec, uh, given an extra allocation, an extraordinary allocation of vaccine if that's where there's hot spots. And we are saying as a region, as one, 11 municipalities, this is a hot spot. And we believe that accordingly, uh, a, an extra amount of the firepower that we have to um, 
allocate against this enemy that is the virus uh, should be allocated to a place where um, it's needed uh, in order to fight something that is uh, more prevalent here than it might be elsewhere. And how that all got sorted out, uh, we're just making the request that that be taken into account in a hotspot, which we believe our region to be right now, and that we be given some extra tools uh, to deal with that. Thank you. We'll go next to Denise Paglinamon from the Canadian Press. Denise? Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, a question for Dr. Villa. Um, the number of residents that Toronto has um, vaccinated, I'm wondering what the percentage is um, for those 80 years and above um, that you've vaccinated. Uh, so, Denise, I'm afraid I don't have those specific data in front of me. Certainly, that 80-plus population is one that was uh, uh, the focus uh, early on. It was one of the phase one priorities. Um, I I'd be very happy to take that offline. Uh, but, you know, in alignment with the uh, earlier question, um, I think these are important bits of information that we use in order to inform our responses uh, and our actions as we seek to increase vaccination throughout the entire population. Uh, you know, we're planning to uh, get those data up and available on our website so that you and the entire public will be able to, uh, um, you know, understand the vaccination in greater detail. So we've just started putting some information up on our uh, monitoring dashboard, there's a section there specific to vaccine. Over time, as the team has the opportunity to enhance what's available, uh, you know, it's my sincere hope that that's the kind of information that you'll be able to access uh, sooner rather than later so that people are aware of what's happening with our vaccination efforts here in the city and where we're directing our efforts in accordance with the data that we collect. Thank you, Dr. Devilla. And my Follow-up is for um, Mayor Tory. Uh, Mayor, I know you've um, answered uh, one of the reporters' questions um, about this already, but uh, this morning or hours ago, uh, it's trending that you said that salons and other services like this may not reopen on April 12th. Um, I know you said that this would depend on the data, but what are you seeing now? Well, it's not so much what I'm seeing, it's what's being reported by the health authorities uh, in the City of Toronto and elsewhere, which is a very disconcerting uh, situation with regard to the rise in uh, case counts and also the rise in the activity of the variants. And I would say this about any uh, decision or any recommendation that had been made about anything that would apply two weeks out, more than two weeks out on April the 12th, which is, I think we better just make sure that what we say to people in a spirit of honesty and in a spirit of common sense that any final decision, while it's not ours to make, it's the provincial government's, um, would more likely be made at a time much closer to that date uh, when we see what's going on with the health circumstances, which you hope will be better, but you have to sort of understand they may not be and that we should be making big decisions like that uh, and, and a host of others uh, when we get closer to that date. And that's all I'm saying. And thank you. We'll go next to Nick Boisvert from CBC News. Nick? Hi, thanks. A uh, question for Mayor Tory and maybe anyone from uh, the bylaw team who's on the call. Uh, we've been hearing from some restaurant uh, owners and workers um, who have said that uh, it seems like they're the ones with the obligation and responsibility to make sure that people aren't dining with others from different households, which is the current gray lockdown rule, but that they haven't really been told how they're supposed to uh, enforce that, whether they're supposed to take IDs or how they're supposed to you know, make sure that that's not happening. Uh, Mayor Tory, I mean, do you think restaurants need a little more help in this in this case? And if anyone from bylaw wants to clarify anything on, on how that process works, uh, I'd be happy to hear that as well. I wouldn't suggest for a minute that the question of how you enforce that is easy or simple, but I would say that uh, just an eyeball test would often, though not always, tell you that uh, certain groups of people are unlikely uh, to live with each other, and if it's especially if it's a larger group, and that therefore you could always offer the option of just saying, I'm afraid I can't serve you, unless you can in some way show me that you live together. But you know, the one thing we have always said we didn't have the capacity or the resources to do is to have either every restaurateur or every bylaw officer going around and checking everybody's driver's license to see if they all bear the same address. There has to be a degree of good faith on the part of people here who want to defeat this virus. 
and it's very interesting and disconcerting that the case uh, counts are, are pushing down to a lower uh, age demographic and in fact the benefits of vaccines are seen by the fact that there are fewer people that are older that are coming down with this now and the variants are of course much more uh, from what I've learned from Dr. Davila much more dangerous even to younger people and so you just have to hope that people are going to self-police uh, to some extent and, and go out with the person they live with if, if they live with someone else uh, and, if, and not go out with groups of friends yet. I mean, we, we will sooner have the day when you can go back out with your friends if people for now follow those rules. I think it is reasonable that restaurateurs in obvious cases where it doesn't quite meet the, uh, the smell test that people uh, are living in the same household together, they might at least ask. Uh, but beyond that, I know it's very difficult to enforce this kind of thing for law enforcement people or for restaurateurs, but people should make the effort. Carlton, uh, Grant, anything you'd like to add to that, to that piece around enforcement of this particular measure? Sorry, was that directed at me? Yes, yeah, sir, Carl. Yeah, sorry, Carlton. Anything you would like to add? No, I think the, the mayor handled it well. It is incumbent upon um, people attending these establishments. Um, our officers are out there as well as Toronto Public Health bylaw in, uh, inspectors, and <clears throat> they are working with uh, restaurateurs to provide them with the information that they have, uh, agree with the challenges of them having to enforce it themselves so that we are, again, actively working with them to, to uh, assist where we can. Thank you, Carlton. Nick, do you have a follow-up? Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks. On a different topic uh, for a colleague of mine, uh, seniors report feeling uncomfortable going to some of the mass immunization clinics. Advocates and family doctors want doctors to be able to provide vaccines in their offices and during home visits. So will TPH work to allow more doctors' offices to vaccinate patients? So a couple of things with that, and, and perhaps I can get the chief to speak to the experience at mass immunization clinics. Uh, I know that the chief has had the uh, lots of opportunity to get down to the clinics. Uh, I have certainly had my opportunities as well uh, to see how well functioning they are. And thus far, the uh, commentary has largely been one of, um, you know, real delight. Uh, that people are, you know, people are receiving the vaccines, they feel that they're treated professionally, uh, that the clinics are well run, and I think this is a real testament to uh, the chief and all those who have been actively engaged in getting these mass immunization clinics up and running. Uh, with respect to what's happening in primary care, uh, there are um, initiatives underway right now uh, largely driven by our provincial counterparts. Uh, they are making vaccines available through a limited number of primary care providers. And we here at Toronto Public Health are, are um, you know, supporting uh, those efforts uh, between the province and primary care uh, providers within the community. Uh, the vaccines that are currently available are a bit challenging in respect of logistics. Uh, they're not quite as simple as administering flu vaccines, um, which is what we're used to seeing. Uh, not, just not that simple in terms of administration of the vaccines and the handling of those vaccines at this point in time. We look forward as more products become available, particularly those that are refrigerator stable, much, much easier within the context of, of uh, your community-based family practice. But I do appreciate that, uh, you know, we're trying to make as many cha channels open um, for vaccine availability, but I would just say that the mass immunization clinics have really received a lot of positive feedback in respect of the experience. Uh, and I would encourage those who are eligible for vaccine to take the opportunity, um, you know, sign up, uh, do get that uh, vaccine as soon as possible uh, in order to protect themselves and to protect our whole community and to rest assured that the experience in mass immunization clinics it is an excellent one uh, and one that we're constantly working at improving, even though it is already uh, very highly uh, spoken of when we speak to clients who've been through. Nick, if I may add, um, just to say that, and just to really as a reminder to say that uh, I certainly appreciate, we all appreciate that the notion, if you will, of you know perhaps signing up and going to a mass immunization clinic may seem daunting. I, I wanna reassure everyone that we have put all of the processes and all of the provisions in place to make that not only safe, but to make that 
as stress-free and as enjoyable an experience as it absolutely can be. Um, folks need to appreciate, they are welcome, we are all welcome to bring with us uh, someone for support, whether that is just for uh, mobility assistance or whether that's just someone for personal support. There's never a need for anyone to uh, be alone. That's, an, that's optional, certainly don't need support, but if someone would, is more comfortable bringing a family member or a caregiver with them, that's absolutely fine. Uh, we have a number of trained staff in each clinic who can help and who in fact are every day helping people from literally the time that they arrive by whatever means, be that public transit or uh, by personal automobile or any other means, they will help them from the time they arrive, get them to where they need to be, and if that is simply helping them get to check-in, that may be it. We have many, many um, clients who have one of our, our first responders or healthcare, per, uh, healthcare professionals who are with them the entire time as they move through the clinic. I, I also think it's important to, to clarify that our clinics now are operating almost line-free. They are, they are very efficient. Uh, people, generally speaking, are not experiencing, experiencing any significant lineups. They're finding the clinic process to be very quick, and as I said uh, when I spoke to the clinic management teams before we came to this press conference, uh, all five of our clinics today are operating, uh, in essence, without lines, and the total amount of time from, from the time someone arrives at the clinic until they have moved through, they have received their vaccination, moved through aftercare and checked out is 30 minutes or less. So um, I just, I really encourage people if you are eligible, if you were born in 1951 or earlier and you have, uh, that makes you eligible of course, book your, book your appointment to come. We have, we have fantastic people in every clinic, caring people who are well trained and well equipped to help you, help, help you get through the process and do that in a very caring and supportive manner that, uh, as Dr. Davila said, the, the people that I interact with and I hear coming out have nothing but praise for the process and uh, I'm certainly appreciative for every one of our staff members that makes that possible. Hey, thank you, Chief. We'll uh, go next to Scott Lightfoot from CTV News. Scott? Thanks, Brad. A uh, question for the Chief. Chief, you mentioned earlier in the um, presser that no doses are being wasted in the city. Can you just sort of clarify how that happens, how you're sure that's the case? And I'm sure you saw on the weekend that one of the clinics opened up a pretty broad open waiting list for the so-called leftover doses and that seemed to be quite popular. It was later changed. but I mean, what is the feasibility of doing something like that in the city for any doses that may not be used by the end of the day? Sure. So uh, let's break those into two pieces. So with respect to dose management, as, uh, as you know, Scott, we've talked about candidly, we administer Pfizer vaccine in our, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine in our city-operated mass immunization clinics. And that means uh, each dose or each vial of Pfizer contains five doses. We very carefully manage... Uh, the usage and the allocation of those doses. Mm -hmm. There are um, highly experienced nurses and healthcare professionals that are managing uh, the loading of each and every syringe. So th those are things that are happening under very close control, very close scrutiny, so that we are only loading the right amount of syringes, we're only puncturing uh, the right amount of vials. And that is, that is a quality control mechanism that we have put in place in all of our clinics to make sure that no dose goes wasted. So uh, being, man being monitored live time and making sure that over the course of the day only the amount of vaccine that is required is being used. The remainder of course anything that remains unused uh, is, is retained. It is used in a subsequent day's inventory and that allows us to reprioritize across the entire city network of clinics uh, making sure that the most, um, the, the absolute most number of doses go into the most amount of eligible arms as soon as uh, as soon as possible so that is the that deals with how we manage it uh, in-house with respect to uh, to the wait list as you heard me say we are a client of the provincial booking system which I have high praise for it continues to work uh, to function very very well we've seen um, thousands upon thousands of people be able to successfully book their appointments online or through the provincial call center one of, the, one of the functions that does not yet, at least, exist within, that, within the, the provincial booking system or the COVAX system is uh, any type of standby or wait list, if you will, functionality. So uh, not something that we can simply turn on, but having said that, as has been the case throughout COVID-19, our immunization task force and our, our overarching uh, COVID-19 strategic command team 
is always looking at opportunities as we are right now. We are, we are looking at a number of different options and continuing to push ourselves really to uh, do anything that is possible to increase and to maximize the amount of vaccine that we can administer to, uh, to people across the city and get as many vaccines rolled out as possible. So ongoing, uh, ongoing work. I too am very interested with what we saw happen uh, in the past the number of days with some of our healthcare partners. And uh, one of the things that we're doing is seeking their feedback on how that process has worked, the methodology that they've used, and then we'll look at that and every other opportunity to, uh, to roll out effective and efficient means within our city operated clinics. So work underway, uh, more to come. And if I can just follow up, you mentioned that there are still a number of open appointments in the city. It seems that there's been a bit of an issue getting people to fill these appointments. And the appointments, I guess, are based on vaccine supply. So what has this sort of done to the planning and distribution of vaccines? And has any thought been given to maybe expanding qualifications rather than just sort of waiting for a set period of time and then lowering it by age, maybe opening up to other people that are supposed to be in the, the second phase a little earlier rather than waiting? I mean, how flexible is the city being on, on filling these spots? Well, Scott, perhaps I'll start, and then I may, I may hand to Dr. Davila with respect to eligibility. Other than, uh, let me start here. So the eligibility for vaccine is determined and established by the province under, the, under their provincial framework, first and foremost. With respect to uh, watching the, the booking activity, uh, my team and our colleagues at Toronto Public Health are watching the bookings that are happening in the provincial booking systems on uh, literally an hourly basis every single day. We watch and we monitor what happens and we've now seen, uh, we have had, had a number of experiences, most recently with the reduction from 75 to 70, that produces an immediate spike in the number of appointments that are built. But we watch very carefully what happens uh, hours a day and over each day. At the point where the number of bookings starts to fall off and if we get to the point where we're seeing fewer and fewer appointments being booked over consecutive days, while there are still appointments uh, available in the system, that is an automatic trigger that comes to our, our immunization task force command team and that initiates conversation with uh, the medical professionals, in this case of course Dr. Deville and the Toronto Public Health team, in order to engage the conversation around whether the, um, the pool, if you will, or the number of uh, the eligibility needs to be expanded such that we can, uh, we can maintain that high booking rate and fill appointments. Dr. Deville may wish to comment further with respect to eligibility. Well, it's hard to add much more. Uh, you know, I have to admit Chief Pegg's become a little bit of a vaccination expert himself, uh, or at least on immunization clinics. But I think the Chief has, has articulated exactly uh, the kind of thing we've tried to do throughout the entire course of the pandemic. You know, look at the situation on the ground, look at what our data are telling us, and then adjust course in accordance with what we're seeing. So uh, this is no different uh, whether we're, t you know, with any aspect uh, of the COVID-19 response, whether it's related to cases or in this case related to vaccines. Uh, obviously our goal is to, you know, in accordance with the provincial prioritization framework, uh, provide, you know, efficient um, and effective means by which to vaccinate the entire population of Toronto uh, as quickly as possible. and. Uh, we're constantly assessing the data and we'll continue to do so until we're actually able to complete that vaccination job that's in front of us in accordance with the provincial plan and of course in concert with our healthcare partners who are part of those vaccination efforts. Thank you, final question is to Dave Ryder from the Toronto Star. Dave. Hi, just following on that, I'm wondering, I think this is for Dr. Devilla, but anybody else wants to chime in. Given that the uh, variants are increasing quickly that they're hitting younger people harder and we're seeing 20 year old uh, people in their 20s, 30s and 40s in hospital on life support. And that we've had this pattern where the city lowers the age, there's an initial rush of registrations for vaccination and then the city begs people to come forward because now there's spots going on. Dr. Devella, has there been thought to just opening it up and saying, you know what, that the situation is so dire that and there's hundreds of thousands of Torontonians ready to come and stick their arm out that anybody who needs uh, vaccination or wants vaccination just come and get it uh, if there's supply. Uh, so, Dave, I, I think that the uh, the final part of your question is 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 perhaps uh, you know one of the most important components of it. This is very much supply dependent. 
but there are constant conversations happening um, and constant assessments and reassessments as to how the vaccination effort is undergoing, how it's going, whether we're talking about mass immunization clinics that are run by the city or the vaccination efforts that are being undertaken through healthcare partners uh, out in the community. We're constantly looking at and talking about um, what we're seeing, uh, where uh, things are going well and where there are opportunities for improvement. Of course, supply um, has been uh, one of the key issues over the past several weeks. We remain hopeful that uh, those challenges will uh, alleviate and no longer be so much part of the conversation. But for now, there continue to be some supply issues uh, still. A and so we're working in accordance with the uh, current supply to try to make sure that we're providing those vaccines as quickly as possible with a mind to reducing mortality and certainly reducing hospitalizations and morbidity related to COVID-19 infections. Thank you. And, and following on supply, I guess, I think this is for Mayor Tory because I think you talked to the Premier and others more than anybody else. It, as of Monday, the province has received 320,000 more doses than it has given. And there's another 450,000 doses arriving from the federal government. Um, but yet we've heard Premier Ford sort of point his finger at, at the federal government saying that's the issue. Mayor Tory, have you asked the provincial officials what's going on, why we seem to have received so many more doses than we've been able to give out? We've had many discussions about uh, supply, and uh, Chief Pegg has probably been involved in more of those at uh, the level of General Hillier and the task force provincially than I have been. Uh, let's also remember that there are things that happen external to all of the governments, including our own and the other two, uh, such as delays in the shipment of, uh, of vaccines and this kind of thing. But, uh, you know, we have certainly made known, uh, for example, um, you know, uh, the desire to have more information about what's going to be coming our way 10 days from now, uh, because I think we're fairly certain of what's coming in the next uh, short period of time, and that's how we've made available all the different appointments we've made available on the basis that we will have the vaccine to uh, inoculate people. And you've heard that the uh, GTHA uh, mayors and chairs today talked about both governments taking a look at even further steps that could be taken, for example, for this region, including the City of Toronto, uh, to take account of the fact that we have a lot of cases on our hands and that uh, the more vaccines we can get into people's arms, uh, the better we're going to be able to fight that off. So um, you know, there are lots of discussions going on all the time about getting as much supply here as we possibly can. Thank you, Mayor Tory. Uh, thank you for joining us. That concludes today's briefing. Our next scheduled briefing will be this Wednesday, March 31st at 2 p.m. Stay well.